section 4.4, properties of rational functions. A rational function is a quotient slash ratio of two polynomials. Ratio of two polynomials. You get a fraction with the polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. So all the rules about polynomials apply to the numerator and denominator individually, but then they have what goes with them totally. So the big little concept deals with if I have a if I have a fraction one over a big number as the denominator gets bigger, the whole thing gets smaller. One over a very large number is a very small number. One over a very little number is a very big number. So for example, if I have one over a million, that's very small, but if I have one over one millionth, that's a very large number. Okay, so if my fractions get smaller than one, if my denominator gets smaller than one, my entire number tends to get larger. Okay? And that's what the rules apply with this. Okay. Graphs approach asymptotes. One of the things we're going to be spending a lot of time working with today, in fact, the entire point of today is finding asymptotes. An asymptote is a line that is, is a value or a line that a graph approaches but does not cross or does not touch. When you get a little more complicated, sometimes they do cross asymptote lines, but when it's way out in the ends, asymptotes don't apply to the squiggly stuff in the middle. Asymptotes apply to the stuff on the ends. In the middle, you can have all kinds of goofy crap going on. It's on the edges is where the asymptotes apply. Okay, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in the end, but sometimes asymptotes lines will cross asymptotes. Sometimes, usually they don't, but it's out at the end. Okay, it kind of depends upon the function. Usually with polynomials, as your numerators and denominators, it doesn't. So vertical asymptotes, VA for vertical asymptotes. We have a vertical asymptote at the line x equals c. So whatever the x coordinate is, okay? So it's x equals c, vertical line. That's the asymptote. If c is a zero of the denominator, so we have an asymptote if c is the zero of the, denom of the denominator, but C is not a zero of the numerator. Or hey. So this is important. What you need to do is set the denominator equal to zero. That will tell you where your possible asymptotes are. But if your asymptotes are also zeros in the numerator, I'm oh, sorry, if your zeros are, at, are also zeros in the numerator, you do not have an asymptote in there. That is what we're going to discuss next time we meet, is what's going on at those places. Very interesting things. A large portion of what we're going to be doing in here, and, and really a very large portion of what you're going to be doing in calculus, is finding the interesting places. Asymptotes are interesting places. Where do those interesting places occur? Anytime you have a zero with a rational function, anytime you have a zero in the numerator or a zero in the denominator, something interesting is happening. Something interesting is happening. Anytime something is equal to zero, generally speaking, something interesting is happening. And that's what you're going to spend a lot of time in calculus trying to find is, where are the interesting places? That's what we're going to be doing in here. Where are the interesting places? Okay. So my first example, f of x equals x over x minus 4. So I want to know where are my vertical asymptotes. 
So I take my denominator, x squared minus 4, set it equal to 0. Where is it equal to 0? Two ways to figure out my zeros. I can factor x plus 2, x minus 2 equals 0. Or I can just add 4 to both sides and square root, and I get x equals plus or minus 2. That's my denominator. Will 2 or negative 2 make my numerator 0? No. So I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2 and x equals negative 2. And I'll show you some graphs here in a minute so you'll understand what vertical asymptotes are going to look like. Okay. So I look at the next one. x squared over x squared plus 1. Set x squared plus 1 equal to 0. Is x squared plus 1 ever equal to 0 in the realm of the real numbers? Because if I, add, if I start including complex numbers, yeah, when, when, x is when x is i or negative i, then I can do that, right? But, or, yeah, okay. But in the realm of real numbers, no. Because what's the smallest value x squared could ever be, no matter what? Zero. Because if I square a negative number, I get a positive. If I square a positive number, I get a positive. Smallest value x squared could ever be is zero. Zero plus one will never be equal to zero. Zero or something larger. Add one to that, you're always positive. So this one has no vertical asymptotes. Not all rational functions have asymptotes. They at least have some certain types of asymptotes. No vertical asymptotes on this. Bottom is never zero, so it's never undefined. It never has that point we have to worry about. Okay. Last one. Okay. And the last one's a little tricky in how you want to look at it. Okay. So there's a couple of ways to do the last one. What actually works easiest, rather than finding just the zeros in the denominator, is to factor it. And this will be extremely helpful when you're doing other things. Factor the numerator and factor the denominator. So your denominator factors into x times x squared plus 9x plus 14. And then that factors, right? Two numbers multiply, give me 14, add to give me 9, 2, and 7. So my denominator becomes x times x plus 2, x plus 7. So where are my zeros in my denominator? 0, negative 2, and negative 7, right? However, factor your numerator. x plus 2, x minus 1. So your x plus 2s reduce. So if you factor out and can reduce, which works out really nice if you can do that, now where are my zeros in my denominator after simplifying and reducing? 0 and 7. So that means I have vertical asymptotes at x equals 0 and x equals negative 7. But although negative 2 is not an asymptote, negative 2 does have something interesting happening. Because even though in my reduced and simplified version it won't give me 0 in my denominator, in my original problem, 0 will, or sorry, <laughs> Negative 2 will make my denominator 0. And so the original problem is undefined at negative 2. It's not an asymptote, but it is something interesting going on there. So let's take a look at the graph. So I have it graphed out here. This is the original function. This is the vertical asymptote at x equals 7. This is vertical asymptote at x equals 0. 
You can't see what's going on at negative two because graphing calculators and graphing programs don't show what's going on when you have what's going on here. Like I said, this is what we're going to be talking about on Friday in a little more detail. Sorry, Thursday in a little more detail. Is what's happening here. Suffice it to say, what we're worried about are the asymptotes. Now, if I zoom out, you can see what I'm talking about with the asymptotes. They look almost identical. The graph comes along and then goes down and it follows along the line, the x-axis, which is one of my asymptotes. They are all, as you zoom out, they look nearly identical. But if I zoom in, they're not. And the closer I zoom in, there's a little space, there's a little space, there's a little space, there's a little space. I can't have zero for x because I'm not allowed to have zero in the denominator. Um, it makes my fraction undefined. So what happens is it gets really close to that value, but it's never actually that value. And then from the other side, it does the same thing. What makes it above or below? The combination of the signs above and below your fraction when you go into it. Some points the fraction is positive, some points it's negative. It actually at one point crosses here. It goes up and above. Okay, but my two vertical asymptotes, the graph does not cross those two vertical asymptotes. And that's what we're talking about. It's lines that it approaches, but does not cross. Okay. Back here. Okay. Horizontal asymptotes. You may have noticed that it appeared that it went out to a straight line as you're going off its sides. Horizontal asymptotes. If the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, then the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, then the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, <coughs> the ratio of the leading coefficients is your horizontal asymptote. Now, horizontal asymptotes generally are not a big deal unless you are very large numbers. A lot of graphs have horizontal asymptotes that the graphs cross at some point. I don't like to use the I don't like to use the definition of an asymptote as a line that doesn't cross. Because sometimes your graph crosses that asymptote. It's only when you're dealing with very, very large numbers, particularly on horizontal asymptotes, that they are actually that you have asymptotic behavior where it approaches but doesn't cross. In the middle, who knows what kind of crap is going on? On the edges, very large numbers is where you're dealing with it doesn't cross is where you deal with the asymptotic behavior usually depends upon how complicated the equation is okay. this is one where if you're looking at the leading coefficient sorry the degree of the numerator degree of the denominator here's how you find your at your horizontal asymptotes you use n behavior models okay you use end behavior models. And the end behavior model is the largest part of your numerator and the largest part of your denominator. Because as x grows really large, because remember, horizontal asymptotes, they happen out at the ends, not in the middle. Vertical asymptotes will happen in the middle. Horizontal asymptotes have to happen way out where? Way out in the boonies. Okay. So when I do that, we're dealing with the end behaviors. That's what we talked about once before. End behavior of my numerator which is x squared, and behavior of my denominator, 2x squared. That's all we're concerned with, because when we get really large, the rest of it is irrelevant. Everything else is irrelevant. When we get large enough numbers, the rest of the numerator and the rest of the denominator are irrelevant. Those are the only things that count. 
That's what the whole graph will eventually look like. X squared over 2X squared, which means eventually it'll look like 1 half. So if my degrees are the same, the X's cancel out, and what do I get? I get 1 half. So my horizontal asymptote for this one is 1 half. which is what's going on here. Okay. So, like I said, in the middle, it crosses. This is my horizontal asymptote, one half. It does cross it. Okay, it crosses, it comes down, crosses it, and then if you zoom out, oops, let's zoom in, zoom out. What happens to it? It comes down, crosses it, and comes up and approaches the line from below. Here it comes down and approaches the line from above. Okay. It's the asymptotic behavior happens way out here and way out here. In the middle, your graphs can cross horizontal asymptotes. It's not a big deal. It's only when they get very, very large. Because in the middle, the smaller values of x do make a difference. When they get really big, it's where the rest of that stuff becomes irrelevant. So that's what's going on here. That's why it's an asymptote. Because out on the ends, they become essentially identical. It approaches the line, does it cross it, but they get so close. It's like the idea, okay, I'm walking to the, to the wall, and I go halfway there, and I stop, and I go halfway, 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 and I stop, and I do half the distance every time. Am I actually ever going to touch the wall? No. Theoretically. In reality, yeah, you can't go half the distance when it gets really, really tiny. You will eventually physically bump the wall because human beings are incapable of going that teeny tiny half the distance every time. But in theory, you're not going to actually touch the wall. That's what an asymptote does. It gets closer and closer and closer and closer. The difference between the graph and the asymptote are essentially the same thing. So I would say, what's my value for really large values? I'd say the graph is equal to 1 half. I'd say it's equal to 1 half when I go really, really small as well. Is it actually 1 half? No, it's never actually 1 half. But it's so close, it doesn't freaking matter. Okay, and we actually do that sometimes. Now, so let's do the other one. I don't have the same situation. My numerator degree is smaller than my denominator degree. But let's go ahead for smarts and giggles and look at our end behavior model. I have 2 over x squared, sorry, 2x squared over x cubed. Now, this one I reduced and I got 1 half. This one, if I reduce, I get 2 over x. Right? I get 2 over x. What happens as x gets really big? 10,000, 10 million, 10 billion. What's happening to 2 over those numbers as it gets really, really large? And it gets really, really small. It gets really close to what? Zero. That's why when our degree of our numerator is smaller than the degree of our denominator, it reduces and our denominator grows so big that this, that this value here approaches zero. It never actually becomes zero. Because the only way it's ever zero is if I get zero on the numerator. But it gets so freaking close to zero, we would eventually essentially call it zero, call it the value of zero, eventually. But what it is, it's approaching that value of zero. That's why it's asymptotic, is it gets really, 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 really close to zero as it gets really large. That's what's going on. So my horizontal asymptote at this point is zero. Now, all you have to know to be able to figure that one out, sorry, it's y equals zero, my bad. This should be y equals one half. And this one should be y equals zero. So it gets asymptotic to the x-axis is what that one does. So every time the numerator is smaller than if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, the horizontal asymptote is zero. Every time. Because let's say this was x to the 10th. That would just make it happen faster. 
right? If it was 2 over x to the a, it would just happen like that rather than taking a little while to get there. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. What? No, what? How can you tell if that two? What if you don't know what the x is? How can you tell it's one? It doesn't matter. Our horizontal asymptotes only take place out at the ends, where numbers are really small. I mean, like negative ten thousand, negative ten million, that kind of thing, or really large, ten thousand, ten million, that kind of stuff, right? So if I put, if I reduce this down, if I put ten million in here, what is two over ten million? Really, 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 really close to zero, isn't it? And the larger that denominator gets, the farther I go out, the closer and closer to zero it gets. So that's what's happening in the graph. The rest of that stuff doesn't make any difference. It's just that part that makes the difference. Okay? Does that make sense? That's the asymptote. That's the line that's the asymptote. Okay. So what you would have is you have the line y equals zero. That's the asymptote. That's the line it will approach. So you have y equals zero, and your graph will come down like this, or up like this, depending upon whether it's positive or negative. But yeah, that's what's going on, <laughs> like that. It doesn't actually touch it, but it gets so close to minus one. Okay. Yes. How do you like if you're just looking at the vertices? Like, how do you know that they're horizontal? Two different things, completely and totally. Horizontal ones. Are strictly about the denominator being being zero. Horizontal ones, sorry, horizontal ones like this. You're dealing with what it approaches with really large numbers. Vertical asymptotes always happen in the center. Almost always happen in the center. They only take place if the denominator is zero, and the numerator is not zero at the same time. That's the, that's where horizontal ones happen. Horizontal ones tend to happen in the middle. Vertical ones tend to happen way out at the end. That's, that's kind of where you have to think. Vertical ones take place if your numbers get really big. Horizontal ones, it doesn't really matter what the number is, it's just where your zeros are, and they tend to take place what we would call the middle. The middle, the middle could be anywhere from where I have a zero to a zero. The big, I mean, when we're talking about the millions and stuff like that. Okay, so that one we found the vertical asymptotes. Could I also find the horizontal ones for that equation? Yeah, yeah, you can. We're just doing one at a time right now. Don't worry, we'll get there. Okay, and now we get to the fun one: oblique asymptotes. Okay. And by fun, I mean well, not so much. Horizontal ones and vertical ones are easy to find. Vertical asymptotes: you look for zero in your denominator. Horizontal asymptotes, you look at the largest power, and if they're equal or if the denominator has a larger power, then you have zero or whatever it reduces down to looking at just the larger powers. When the numerator has a larger power than the denominator, when the numerator has a higher degree than the denominator, then we have an oblique asymptote. Rather than being a horizontal line or a vertical line, it is an angled line. Okay. To find the oblique asymptote, you must divide the numerator by the denominator. The result you get is your oblique asymptote, ignoring the remainders. The remainders are irrelevant for your oblique asymptotes. Because it was a factor, if it, your remainder was zero, it'd be a factor you'd be able to reduce, and it, it, that would graph as a straight line. If I divided x, if I divided the numerator by the denominator and I have no remainder, I would have a straight line. That would my graph would look like a straight line with a missing part. Okay? Because that's what it would reduce down to. But if it doesn't go in evenly, then I have an oblique asymptote. Okay. And my oblique asymptote is when I take the numerator and divide it by the denominator, what do I get? That equation that I get, that answer I get, is my graph. Okay. 
So we need to divide this. Synthetic division works really nice on this one. Okay. So I have 5, and I have 1, negative 1, negative 2. Bring down the 1. That is a 5. It's a crappy 5. So I get 5 and 4, and then 20 and 18. However, my remainder is irrelevant for what I'm doing. Yes. So you picked 5 because that's what was... No, I, do, I did not pick 5. 5 was told to me. From the denominator. Take the numerator, divide it by the denominator. So you're doing the Yeah. Well, actually, no, I'm dividing, I'm doing synthetic division. Remember, synthetic division is what? It's the opposite of whatever you have for your factor into there. If you want to do long division, you can do x minus 5 and 2x squared minus x minus 2, and you can do that instead. But you have to divide the numerator by the denominator. And then what do I get? This is actually x plus 4, right? So I get the equation y equals x plus 4. This is my oblique asymptote. You divide it, whatever you get when you divide, that's your oblique asymptote. Whatever that line is. Okay. Now, do I have any other asymptotes going on here? Do I have a vertical, do I have a horizontal asymptote? <laughs> no, because my power in my numerator is larger than the power in the denominator. I do not have any horizontal asymptotes at all. That's my oblique asymptotes. Do I have any vertical asymptotes? Yes. Yeah, my vertical asymptote takes place where? At x equals 5, where my 0 in my denominator is. So once again, There's my graph. Now, this doesn't show the whole thing, but you can see here's my oblique asymptote. Y equals X plus 4. Here is my vertical asymptote at 5. If I zoom out, you actually see that it's above here and above here. So it's oblique on both sides of the equation. It's vertical in between. This is usually what happens when you have oblique asymptotes, is it looks something like this. This is often what you'll get. You can get some really weird looking stuff. Kind of depends upon the size of the numerators and the size of the denominator. Okay? But this is what we're dealing with usually. Yes? Will we be expected to graph them? No, you will not necessarily be expected to graph them. But graphing really just gives you a good picture of what we're talking about here. That's, that's what I want to do. A graph is worth a thousand data points. Okay. It's often to see, you can talk about what's happening, but if you see it, it makes a little more sense. Okay? So that's what we're dealing with. Questions? Okay, let's go back to our notes. Find all of the asymptotes. So, we have three types of asymptotes to find. We have our vertical asymptotes, we have our horizontal asymptotes, we have our oblique asymptotes. You're not going to get horizontal and oblique at the same time with these types of rational functions. The only time you're going to have crap like that is if you don't have a polynomial and you don't have a polynomial, you've got other stuff going on. Because you can have rational functions that are not polynomial over polynomial. You can have like a trig function, and then you can have a logarithmic function, and boy, it can get really funky in a hurry. Okay? They're really funky, and you still have asymptotes, and you've got all kinds of stuff going on. Man, it can just get really weird really fast. Now, you start throwing roots and things like that in there, you can have all kinds of goofy crap going on. Okay? Um, one, of, one of my favorites, AP test questions. But they actually threw out of the AP test grading, and I was really mad at them for doing this. They had to find the horizontal asymptotes. And for the ones that you're doing here, your horizontal asymptotes are the same in both directions. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes your horizontal asymptotes are the negative, and sometimes the one of the positive are two different numbers. 
in calculus, you will work those out. We're not doing that in here. But one of the AP questions, it was multiple choice, and they said the preponderance of students who earned a five, which is the highest score you can get on an AP test, is a five, preponderance of students that got a five on the test gave the same incorrect answer. They said it was only the one asymptote, even though the numbers were different in two different directions. And I'm saying, I don't care. That was one of the valid answers. They should get the point. They should not get a point if they didn't look in both directions, because that's part of the thing that they had to do was look in both directions. So I would have said, no, keep the stupid question. It's already getting a five, so what's one more question? Right? That's why I look at it, because you can't get any more. One more question isn't going to make a difference, because you've already gotten a five. One more point won't matter, because you don't know how many points you get. You just know if you got a one, two, three, four, or five. I don't know how many points any of my students have ever gotten. I just know if they got a one through a five. And so I don't know if they got who got that one right or not. That really bothers me. Now you don't have to worry about that. A four found to be a five and not one question. No, because they said the students who got a five missed it. Well, they got a five. Who cares? They got a four, and that was the one point they got wrong, and that's the one that they got wrong. Yes, it really ticks me off that one point can make the difference. Because if I get a t if I get results back and I have a kid to get kids to get threes and kids to get fours, how do I know it wasn't one question that was the difference between a three and a four? They would have gotten one more right. They would have gotten a four. I don't know. Could have been they got a three because they got one more right than they needed to get a two. I don't know. Okay, so final asymptotes. Okay, first one. Do I have any vertical asymptotes? Is the denominator zero at any point? Yes. Yeah, where is my denominator zero? At three and two. Because if I take the denominator and factor it out, x uh, minus two, x minus 3, right? Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. Negative 2 plus negative 3 is negative 5. So I have zeros where? I have zeros at 2 and 3. Those are my possible vertical asymptotes. What would make them not zeros or not, not vertical asymptotes? If the numerator is zero, what do I, what kind of a polynomial do I have in my numerator? <laughs> I have the difference of two cubes, which factors into x minus three, or sorry, x minus two. The cube root of the first minus the cube root of the second. X squared plus two x plus four. You must remember the formula. I am going to give you the formula. I'm going to write it over here on the board. Okay, you did this now for two. Yep, so a cubed plus or minus b cubed. Two cubes, sum of cubes or difference of cubes is equal to a plus or minus. The sign is the same as what's between them. A plus or minus b times the square of the first term. The opposite of the sign, minus plus, the multiple of the two terms plus the last term squared. <coughs> Always. Okay. Now, here's the thing. So my first one is factorable, but my second one is not. So this is factorable. These two are not factorable from here. Because <coughs> you cannot factor the factor. The quadratic you get is not factorable at this point. Okay. So are any of my zeros in my denominator also zeros in my numerator? Yes. Yeah, they are. So that means... Two is not a is not 
a vertical asymptote. So I have a vertical asymptote at a vertical asymptote at x equals three. So you look for vertical asymptotes because if you're going to have anywhere your denominator is zero and your numerator is not, you have a vertical asymptote. You're almost guaranteed to have that. You will not have with the problems you are having today, or I should say in this chapter at this time, you will not have oblique and horizontal both. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. It's either oblique or horizontal. You will not have both of them. So if I look at this problem here, okay, I look at my largest powers. X cubed over X squared. Am I going to have oblique or horizontal? Oblique, because my the degree in my numerator is larger than my degree in my denominator. I have to have oblique. And in order to find oblique, I need to divide. Which means in this case, long division. Oh. You cannot do synthetic division because what am I dividing by? I'm dividing by a quadratic. And you cannot reduce and then divide. You have to divide as they stand. So what do I have to do on this one? I have to do long division. So my denominator, x squared minus 5x plus 6. My numerator, x cubed plus 0x squared plus 0x minus 8. And this actually is not difficult long division. It really isn't. X squared goes into X cubed how many times? One, X times, right? So it goes in X times. X times X squared, X cubed. X times negative 5X, negative 5X squared. X times 6 plus 6X. And then I subtract x cubed minus x cubed, gone. 0 minus negative 5. What's 0 minus negative 5? Five. 5. So I have 5x squared. 0 minus 6 minus 6x. And then bring down the minus 8. Repeat. x squared goes into 5x squared how many times? 5 times. So I have plus 5. And then I get 5x squared minus 25x plus 30. And I subtract. And guess what? My remainder is irrelevant. As long as these first two here cancel out, because I'm at the end there, and these two here cancel each other out, whatever's down here is irrelevant. My oblique asymptote is y equals x plus 5. Yeah, that's my oblique asymptote. OK? You cannot have oblique and horizontal at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. Check for horizontal first. They're easier. What? You, you, with what we're doing here, you won't have both at the same time. You will not have both at the same time on this. Look at the powers. Which one's larger? If the numerator is bigger than the denominator, it's oblique. If they're the same or the denominator is larger, it's horizontal. Okay, your turn. Do that one. Find the asymptotes for um, R of X. 
Okay. So let's take a look at these. So, guys. So the first one, vertical asymptotes, you're more than likely going to have, because the only time you don't have them is if the zero is both the numerator and the denominator. And when you have polynomials where zeros in the numerator and the denominator both, that would be one because both polynomials are potential across each other out. So that's not going to happen. So what I would do is factor your numerators and denominators. Factor them out if you can. So if you do that, you get 2x plus 3 times x minus 4 over 3x plus 1 over x minus 4. So where is my zero in the denominator that is not a zero in my numerator? Comes from here, because those will reduce each other out. 3x plus 1 gives me a zero of negative 1 third. So that is my vertical asymptote. x equals negative 1 third. Okay, set that factor equal to zero, you get negative 1 third. That is my vertical asymptote. Now I either look for horizontal or oblique. And what I do is I look at the I look at the largest powers. I look at the degree. In the numerator, I have a degree 2. In the denominator, I have a degree 2. If the degree is the same, then I have 2x squared over 3x squared, which becomes 2 thirds. So I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 thirds. The degree is the same, that's what you're going to get. So, horizontal asymptotes Because it's whatever y equals when you get really far out. Horizontal lines are y equals. And asymptotes, generally speaking, are straight lines. Okay, if you have asymptotes, that's pretty much what you're dealing with are straight lines. Oblique, horizontal, vertical, they're all straight lines. Questions? Thank you.